Hi folks and welcome to Open Analysis Live. So apologies for the delay in the video. It was Valentine's Day last week. So I took a day off and also we had some technical difficulties. There's something that happens just with the, like with the VMs going and the recording software. It just, it really slows everything down. So there are some issues I had to overcome. Anyway, so today we're going to take a look at a sample that uh, subscriber Endurance T sent in to us. And uh, Endurance T has actually been a subscriber since the beginning of our channel, so thanks a lot for the support. And the sample that he sent in is actually quite interesting. So he'd mentioned that it's doing some funny stuff and it looks like it's packed, but when he opened it in some packer detectors, it nothing's really detected. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at it, find out is it packed? If it is, we're going to unpack it. Hint, it's probably packed. And we'll show you guys the technique that we use to unpack it. So what we're going to be using to Take a look at the sample is our Windows 7 VM here. I've just copied it over uh, to the desktop and called it bad. And there's a couple of tools installed in the VM that you'll see me using, which I will link in the description below of the video if you guys want to install them. So the first thing I want to do is uh, take a look at the sample with Detect It Easy and just see if it detects a packer. So I'll drag the file over here. And it doesn't detect a packer, which isn't really a surprise. It does detect that it's C++ compiled here, but it doesn't detect a packer. Now this is actually really common for like custom packers, especially with malware, because a lot of the time these packers are sort of like one-off custom things that the malware developer has actually developed themselves. So there just aren't common signatures for them. So tools like Detect It Easy and PEID and stuff like that are good for detecting like common commercial packers or like really popular packers. But of course they can't have signatures for every type of packer. So so sometimes they won't be able to tell you that a sample is packed, but I'll show you guys in a minute. When you run the sample, you'll be able to see, oh yeah, it's probably packed. And another way to take a look at that is just, you could also just look at the sample, look at the strings and see if there's any plain text strings or how many imports the sample has. That's also a good way to tell whether a sample is packed or not. So uh, let's do it like the easy way. We'll just open Process Explorer, which I've renamed to Fun Fun, which is a trick that I do just in case the malware is looking for the string name Process Explorer in the running process tree. Because I renamed to Fun Fun, a lot of times that kind of bypasses any like Process Explorer detection stuff. So I'm gonna run that as administrator here. Okay, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a copy of this file here and paste it on the desktop. And I'm going to run the copy just in case it deletes itself. A lot of malware will like delete itself after it's run to sort of hide the fact that it's running. And this is the only copy I have. I don't I don't want to have to like recopy it over again. So I just make a copy of it here. So let's run it, and we see it's running here in Process Explorer, and it starts another copy. It kills itself. It starts a child, um, and then there's like another copy started here uh, under a different name. So it spawns something else under a different name which I've just suspended just to make sure that it doesn't do anything crazy so I'm gonna actually kill it here so what we've learned from running it is it creates a couple of child processes so if we want to look at unpacking halt state so this is like how do you know when it's unpacked if you're running it one of the things we could look for is a hook on create process internal which is one of the lowest level API calls you can have in user land to create a process so a lot of create process calls all sort of filter down into create process internal W so we can hook that and then once that API is hit, we'll know that probably the code is unpacked and then we can start taking a look and see what's going on. So why don't we do that? And you can also see that that copy that I made has actually deleted itself. So it was a good idea that I made a copy. Okay, so now let's open the sample in X32 debug, the 32-bit version of X64 debug. And we're going to have to set a breakpoint on create process internal because that's what we saw. We saw it was creating a child process, so we expect that that's probably the halt state for this PE file. So that's when it's actually gonna be unpacked in memory. So we'll pop over to symbols, kernel 32, and we'll look for create process, create process internal W, and I'll just right click and toggle breakpoint. So now I'm just gonna run until we hit that breakpoint. So we're gonna run, we're gonna hit the entry point here. We're gonna run and we hit the create process internal breakpoint. So now we know that somewhere in memory is probably an unpacked version of this PE file. So then we pop over to our memory map here and uh, we start looking for protected sections that are marked as execute. So you can see like ERW, so E for execute, R for readable and W for writable. So if it's gonna be executed in memory, it needs to be marked as executable. So you can see, for example, here is the PE file that we loaded bad.exe and you can see that the text section that can contains the executable code is marked as executable. But there's other sections in memory, like right here, which is also marked as executable, but it's not within a PE file. So it's uh, it's just an allocated memory segment. So anytime you see that, it's definitely worth investigating, taking a look at and seeing what's going on because 
you know, it shouldn't be executable. It should just be a memory segment that you're reading and writing from. So the way we can take a look at it is we can just like right click and follow in dump and take a look at it here. So it looks like there's no indication that this is a PE file. Uh, it looks more like it's uh, some code that's maybe being executed. And what we're looking for, because we're lazy, is we're looking for a PE header because we're hoping that the entire PE file has been injected into memory. This is the first thing we look for. It's not always going to be there. It's not always going to be as easy as just dumping a PE file out of memory, but it's the first thing we check for. So we want to go back and see, are there any other memory segments that are executable as well? So it, it looks like up here, there's another section that's uh, executable as well. So let's follow that in the dump and we'll see, hey, there we go. <laughs> there's a PE header. So this means that there is a uh, PE file injected into memory where there's no defined file. So it wasn't loaded by the operating system. It was just injected in there. We can see it has a PE header and it's marked as executable. So when we see something like that, we want to dump it out and uh, take a closer look at it. So the way we do that is we just like right click and uh, write the dump to a file and we'll write it to our desktop here and we'll just save it with the default file name here. Just had to turn on the light there for a minute. It's kind of getting dark in here. <laughs> Okay, so we have dumped out this file to the desktop. So let's use PE bear, take a look at it, which is just a, a PE file parser. So we'll just drop it over. And the first thing I wanna do is I wanna look at these sections here. So let's go to the section headers. And so we can see there's four sections here, two data, a relocation table, and the text section, which contains the code. And so the text section, I wanna look and see what, what the actual file looks like. So we'll click on the text section here and we can see that it's actually all zeros. So this is like my way of checking to see whether the file is mapped or unmapped. What I mean by that is there's, there's kind of two formats that a PE file can be in. So the first format is the format that you would find it on disk as a file. So this is just the standard format of a PE file and all the headers will match the raw offsets. So the raw offsets mean like where in the actual file the section headers are located. And then the second state of the PE file is when it's mapped into memory. So this is when the file on disk is then mapped into memory and ready to be run. And when that happens, all of the sections are transferred from their raw address to a virtual address. It's kind of like they split the PE apart and then inject it into memory. So a lot of the times what will happen is if you dump a file and it's in the mapped format and then you go and click on the section here to see what it looks like in the raw format and you see zeros, it usually means that the file is mapped because the raw pointer is pointing to some address in memory where there is no PE section. It's just a bunch of blank space. So what we would expect to see here is a, is a bunch of hex codes for the code that that's going to be executed. So there's a couple different ways that you can unmap a file that's been dumped that's mapped in memory. And I've showed in some of our other videos ways to unmap files using like the PE unmapper tool from Hasher's Aid. So if you guys are interested, I'll actually link that video below. But in this video, I'm going to show you an easier way to do it. And, and this method is actually quite straightforward. So all we do is we actually adjust the raw offsets of the PE header to match the virtual offsets. And that basically just tells the PE file to address those sections as they exist now because they're in their map state. So by doing that, you kind of force the PE file to look the same in its map version and unmap version. So you basically say like the sections are always going to be aligned in the same area. Now, when you do this, you have to actually turn off relocations because of course the relocation table is not, no longer going to be applicable. So that's one of the drawbacks of doing this. And it also means that your PE file is going to be way bigger, of course, because you're now using the uh, virtual expanded version of the PE instead of the standard raw version. But it's not a big deal, and especially if we just want to open an IDA to start reverse engineering it, and we're not going to be trying like running this PE file or anything like that. This is a, a quick way to do it. So all we do is just copy these virtual addresses over to raw. So 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 7, 1, 2, 3, 8, 1, 2, 3. Okay. And the other thing we have to do after we've realigned these sections is we need to change the base address in the optional header. So this is where the actual PE file is loaded in memory to match the base address where we pulled it from memory so that everything aligns properly. So that's gonna be six, one, two, three, four. Okay, and we'll dump that file out to the desktop. And now I like to call it aligned 
just as a, just because I kind of think of it as like realigning the PE file from mapped to unmapped. Now that we have that, let's take a look at the imports here and they haven't actually been fixed by that unmapping and that sometimes happens. So sometimes when you unmap a file using that technique, it'll actually realign it in such a way that the import address table is now addressable uh, and sometimes it doesn't. So in this case, it hasn't. Now this is kind of a special case where using imprec or Scylla doesn't really work very well to try and rebuild the import address table. And that's because this file is actually existing in a memory segment that's completely outside of where the PE file is. And so when you try and use like Scylla or imprec to rebuild the import address table for this file, what happens is those tools tend to want to change the, the base address that we just altered here. They try and change the image base to align with the PE file. Even if you say like, don't use the PE file header from disk and stuff like that, there's, there's something in there that, that I haven't figured out um, how to tell it like, hey, just build the import table, don't mess around with anything else. So I, I wasn't able to get those tools to work. And this is a pretty common case anytime that you're trying to build an import table for a PE file that's completely out of the memory region of the process that you're actually attaching to. So there's a script that Sean and I wrote that's on our GitHub, which I will link in the description of the video below. And all that script does is it actually tries to rebuild the imports based on brute forcing them. So it'll find any references that might be an import and then it'll build a new import address table based on those imports that it finds. And I think that's what I'm gonna to use to rebuild these imports because it's actually gonna work in this case. So I have that saved on the desktop and we'll just pop over to it now and let's see the help file for it. Okay, so it expects an input file, which is the file that we just realigned here with the broken import address table. And then there's an output file where it outputs the file with the fixed import address table. And then we have a PID that for the process that it attaches to, the base address and the original entry point. And the original entry point is the virtual address for it, not the RVA. And I'll explain that when we get to it. It's, it's one of the important parts of why this tool works and, and other tools don't. So input file and the output file. I'm just gonna call the output file fixed here. And then we have the PID to attach to, which is 2980. And then we have the base address. And the base address, in this case, these are all specified in decimal, not hex, which we should definitely fix <laughs> at some point. So I have to calculate from six and four zeros into decimal, and I'll use a calculator to do that. Hex, six, one, two, three, four, into decimal. 39393216. Okay, and then we have to do the same thing for the OEP. Now, here's the thing about the original entry point. If we look in PE bear here and we look at the entry point, it's 3902 hex. And that's actually the offset from the base address. So we call that the relative virtual address, so the RVA. And the way the tool works is that actually takes the virtual address. So the address actually in the process memory where the entry point is. Now, because we have the RVA, we have to turn it into a virtual address. So to do that, we just basically add the entry point to the base address, and then that's that's actually the virtual address. So in the calculator, if we go back to hex, that's the base address, and we're just gonna add to it the uh, RVA of the entry point. So 3902. Okay, so 63902 is the virtual address, and if we convert that into decimal, we can plug that into our script here. Okay, and then we run it, and it found all these imports here, and it's rebuilt the import table, and then if we refresh here, it's created that file, uh, fixed file on our desktop here. So now what I wanna do is I wanna pop over to our other VM, and I wanna show you this newly fixed file in IDA to show you that it works, and all the imports have been populated for it. Okay, so we've opened up the file that we just fixed in our other VM. We've opened it up in IDA here, and let's take a look at it. So here's the start function. I'm just gonna control F5, turn it into the hex rays view so it's easier to parse through it here. So let's take a look at some of the functions here. It looks like everything's kind of aligned properly. Our strings are referenced, and you can see here all the imports are referenced too. So if we look at our imports table, that's all correctly set up here. And like I said, all the strings here are also referenced, which is always a good indication that you've realigned everything correctly. So here is our first step in unpacking this sample. Now, if you look at some of these strings, you can Google for them, which might give you a hint about what the next video is going to be in the series here. This is actually an emotet sample, and this is the loader for the emotet loader. So this is the very first stage of emotet that we've unpacked here. And so there's going to be a few more stages, and emotet is quite an interesting sample to take a look at. So stay tuned. 
So just to do the recap, we ran it using Process Explorer to identify what the halt state would be. So what APIs we could hook to indicate that it would be unpacked in memory. So we found that it creates a child process. So we hooked create process internal and that would be our halt state. We ran until we hit create process internal and then we looked for read write executable memory sections in the memory of the process. Once we found one that had a PE file in it, we dumped that out, then we unmapped the PE file and we used uh, our import rebuilder to rebuild the imports for it. And now we've loaded up an IDA and we can take a closer look. So hopefully this is gonna be useful for you guys dealing with other similar malware that's packed in the same way. Thanks again to Endurance T for sending the sample in. It's a really good one and certainly fun to, to take a look at. And thanks to everyone else who's sending great comments and samples for us to analyze. We now have a nice queue of stuff that we need to look at and some good video ideas. So thank you so much. Remember if you guys aren't subscribed to subscribe down below one video every week. We'll try and keep this up. Even if it's a bit delayed, we'll still try and keep it up. And until next week, keep exposing the mechanics behind the malware and stay curious.